Okay, let's talk crypto markets. You've probably heard of futures contracts, right? These agreements to buy or sell something later. Pretty standard stuff. But then there's this other thing, huge in crypto. Perpetual contracts. People use them for everything. Hedging, yeah, but also speculating with just massive leverage. Like crazy leverage sometimes, over 100x your margin. Exactly. And the really weird part, unlike normal futures, they never expire. Which right away brings up a question. If there's no expiry date forcing the price back to the spot price of Bitcoin or Ether, how do you keep them linked? How do you stop the contract price just drifting off? Yeah, what's the anchor? And the thing is, they do drift. You see the perpetual trading at a, you know, a noticeable premium or discount compared to the spot price. Which looks, on the surface, like a classic arbitrage play, right? A risk-free profit just sitting there. It seems like it. But these differences stick around, sometimes for ages. So why aren't they just instantly arbitraged away? If there's a mechanism, why doesn't it work perfectly? And that is the big puzzle this deep dive is all about. We're looking at this really interesting research paper that digs right into that, using actual data from Binance. And it kind of challenges the standard thinking, finds a pretty surprising answer. Okay, let's unpack this then. Our goal here is to pull out the key insights from this paper. We need to get the basic mechanics, understand this surprising theory they've got. The core finding, yeah. And then see what the real world data shows about where the real arbitrage opportunities might be. Or maybe where they aren't. Right. Should be some aha moments, hopefully, about how this market actually ticks. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. So, okay, stepping back. Perpetual contracts futures without an end date. You mentioned the high leverage. That's key to their popularity. Absolutely. Let's traders control big positions with less capital down. And the mechanism meant to keep the perpetual price somewhat close to the spot price is this thing called the funding swap. Unique to perpetuals. It's a periodic payment, usually every eight hours on Binance, between the longs and the shorts. And who pays who depends on the funding rate. Exactly. Which itself is based on the difference between the perpetual price and the spot price. So if the perpetual is trading higher than spot a premium... Then the funding rate is usually positive. Longs pay shorts. Okay, so that makes it expensive to be long, encourages shorting. And buying spot, theoretically pulling the prices back together. And if the perpetual is below spot, a discount. Shorts pay longs. The incentive flips. Encourages longing the perp, selling spot. Seems elegant. Arbitragers should just jump in, collect the funding, hedge the risk, done. That's the simple theory. But the paper points out, and you see it clearly in their figure one, the actual price ratio between the perpetual and spot. Well, it deviates from one way more often and by way more than just transaction fees would explain. Right. So the standard models, just looking at trading costs, predict this really tight band the ratio should stay in. Yeah, the dashed lines in that figure. But the real data, the solid line, is outside those narrow bounds a lot of the time. Okay, so that's the mystery. The existing theory doesn't fully cut it. Something else must be going on. And this is the paper's big contribution. They argue everyone's been missing a crucial detail inside the funding mechanism itself, something called the clamping function. Okay. Sounds technical. A little, but the concept isn't too bad. Think of it like a limiter or a governor on that funding rate. It's a rule, a bit of math. Clamp X, they call it. That's the one. It basically stabilizes the funding payments when the price difference between the perpetual and spot is small. Right, stabilizes. Figure two shows it. The real funding rate with clamping, it's flat in the middle. Exactly. When that premium discount index, essentially the percentage price gap is inside this little window from minus eta to plus eta, the funding rate doesn't react to the gap at all. It just sits at some tiny base interest rate. It's not pushing the price back. Not based on the deviation, no. Not within that zone. Compare that to the theory without clamping that orange line, which would always be trying to pull the price back, even for tiny gaps. Wow, okay. So the clamping creates this dead zone. That's a good way to put it. A range where small price differences can just sit there without 
the funding rate kicking in strongly to correct them based on that difference. So this isn't just a tiny adjustment. It fundamentally changes the theory. Small deviations aren't necessarily arbitrage opportunities waiting to be snapped up. They're actually allowed to exist by the design within that clamped range. The funding mechanism is just temporarily ignoring them, so to speak. So models that ignore clamping see a single equilibrium price, maybe plus or minus some fees. But with clamping, it's not a point, it's an interval. Precisely. And that leads the paper to derive these new, more accurate, no arbitrage bounds. The price limits where theoretically risk-free profit is possible outside them, but not inside. Right. And by factoring in both the clamping function and transaction fees, they calculate these new, wider bounds for that perpetual to spot price ratio. And here's a really wild part of their theory. Even if you imagine zero transaction fees, the clamping function by itself is enough to create an interval for the no arbitrage bounds. It's not just fees widening a point. The clamp fundamentally creates a range where the price can sit without triggering arbitrage based on funding flows. That's a key insight. The clamp itself changes the equilibrium. So what determines how wide these new bounds are? Well, logically, it depends on a few things. The clamping factor, eta itself, how big is that dead zone? Bigger eta, wider bounds. Makes sense. Then, obviously, transaction fees, spot mm -hmm. fees, futures fees, Kia and their math. Every basis point eats into potential arbitrage profit. So higher fees also mean wider bounds. Correct. And finally, the relevant interest rates. The cost of holding or borrowing the assets involved, like USD or the crypto itself, RTRC or NORRC. Okay, so clamp size, fees, interest rates all contribute to how much the price can deviate before a real arbitrage opportunity opens up, according to this new model. And they give a good intuition for why the old strategies might fail. Imagine the price ratio goes outside the old narrow bounds, the ones ignoring the clamp. Yeah, looks like arbitrage time. But it's still inside the new wider bounds. If you try the standard play, long the perp, short the spot, manage your cash. You expect to collect that funding difference. But because of the cramp, the funding income you actually get might be way less than you expected, maybe even zero if you're in that dead zone. So the trade could end up unprofitable, even though it looked good on the old model. Ah, okay. That clearly shows why just looking at fees wasn't enough. The clamp neuters the funding mechanism for small deviations. Exactly. Theory is one thing, though. Did it actually match the real market? Right, the empirical tests. They used two years of hourly Binance data, April 23 to March 25. Yep, covering Bitcoin and Ether, and importantly, both types of contracts. Linear, the USDT quoted ones. Like BTC, USDT, ETH, USDT. And the inverse, USD quoted ones, which they proxied using USDC spot data, since direct USD spot isn't always there. And they plugged in realistic numbers, interest rates from T-bills and Binance borrowing. Uh-huh, and low transaction fees, like the best maker tier. 0.9 BPs each way for spot, zero for perps. And the crucial bit, the clamping factor, ADA, set to five basis points, just like the contract specs say. Okay, so what did the data show? Figure five, the linear contracts. Pretty compelling, the actual perpetual to spot ratio that rates, it overwhelmingly stays inside or very, very close to the new bound they calculated the solid lines. So the model fits reality quite well. It seems so. There are occasional spikes outside, yeah, but they're short-lived often during big market moves or volume surges, like you see in figures three and four. But here's the kicker. Compare that to the old bounds, the dashed lines ignoring the clamp. Right. In that same figure five, the price ratio is outside those outdated narrower bounds most of the time. Wow. Okay, that's strong evidence. It really suggests the clamping function is essential to understanding why these deviations persist and where the actual arbitrage limits are. It looks that way. The model of the clamp just matches the observed data much, much better. What about the inverse contracts? Figure 6, BTC USD, ETH USD. Similar story in that the ratio mostly stays within the new bounds, but it definitely looks more volatile. Yeah, more jaggedy. And it seems to cross the bounds more often than the linear ones did. It does appear that way. The paper suggests a possible reason, looking back at market data, like in Figure 4, generally lower trading volume and liquidity for these inverse contracts on Binance compared to the linear ones. Lower liquidity could mean bigger, faster price swings and potentially make it harder or riskier for arbitragers to step in quickly and effectively, even if the price does breach the theoretical bound momentarily. Liquidity matters. Makes sense. Did they check their assumptions for the inverse contracts? They did. Assumption 4.2, basically ensuring the price differences don't get completely out of control. Figure 7 shows that assumption holds up in the data, which adds confidence to their inverse results too. 
So even with the right bounds, market realities like liquidity affect how perfectly arbitrage works. Definitely. The map isn't always the territory, especially in less liquid corners. Okay, so let's talk about the potential downsides. Or maybe it's better to frame it as the factors the paper identifies that limit arbitrage and let these price gaps hang around. Yeah, less downsides of the strategy and more features of the market that define the opportunity set. Right. So number one has to be the clamping function itself. Absolutely. That dead zone it creates is the primary reason small discrepancies aren't arbitrage opportunities according to this model. It's built in for stability, but the side effect is permitting these deviations. So what looks like a mispricing under an old lens is actually within the expected range under the new one. Precisely. Then factor two, good old transaction fees. Can't escape those. Even tiny fees add up when you're doing multiple legs of a trade. They absolutely eat into the potential profit, effectively widening the practical no arbitrage band even further than the theoretical one. And factor three, as we just discussed with inverse contracts, liquidity and market structure. Yeah. Lower liquidity means wider spreads, maybe, more slippage when you trade, higher volatility, all making arbitrage harder and riskier. What looks good on paper might be tough to execute profitably at scale. And finally, even with the better bounds, those occasional spikes outside during big market events show arbitrage isn't instant magic. Right. Markets can get temporarily dislocated, especially during huge volume surges or crashes. Arbitrage forces take time to work, and conditions can change rapidly. Plus, the inverse bounds rely on those assumptions holding. So these aren't really flaws, just the reality of how these contracts and markets are designed and behave. Exactly. The paper illuminates these constraints. Okay, let's connect this back to you, the listener. What's the big takeaway here? I think the main thing is understanding that those price gaps you see in perpetuals aren't just noise or simple fee effects. There's this specific mechanism, the clamping function designed for stability. But which, as a consequence, creates this defined range where prices can differ from spot without automatically triggering a strong corrective funding flow. Right. Gives you a much more realistic picture of how these markets work. You can see where actual potential inefficiencies might lie outside those wider clamp-adjusted bounds versus deviations that are just part of the system's design. So it helps distinguish between a feature and a bug, essentially. In a way, yeah. It shows why arbitrage here is defined by these very specific contract details, not just a simple textbook model plus fees. It refines your view on what's a real mispricing versus what's just the market operating within its design parameters. Well played. OK, so recapping. We've taken a deep dive into this paper that seems to really nail down why price discrepancies persist in crypto perpetuals. The key was this often ignored detail, the clamping function. Yeah, showing it's crucial for understanding the real no arbitrage bounds and explaining the empirical data we see. It highlights that trade-off between stability and perfect efficiency. So here's a final thought to chew on. Given that this clamping function creates a sort of safe zone where small price deviations can exist without triggering strong arbitrage via funding, how might traders think about those deviations within the zone? Mm. If they're not immediate signs of mispricing. Right. If they're theoretically allowed by the contract design, does that change how you interpret them? Maybe they signal something else about market sentiment or positioning within that allowed range rather than just being noise waiting to be corrected. That's interesting. Does knowing it's allowed change how you might trade based on it or ignore it? Exactly. What does this intentional dead zone tell us about that fundamental balance the exchanges are striking between keeping the funding mechanism stable versus ensuring the perpetual price perfectly tracks spot at all times? It's a fascinating tension, something to think about. 